Hi everybody and welcome to our webinar today. Welcome to our One Health series of five think tank webinars today. My name is Dawn Peacock and I am the Director of Programmes for ActAsia um, and we'll be one of the co-hosts today along with Pei Su. The webinar today will be recorded um, and the link will be put on our website afterwards but we will also be live on Facebook and YouTube as well. So how did we get here? Um, Act Asia, we've been talking about um, how to get discussion going, bearing in mind the livestock lists um, proposal deadline is coming up on the 8th of May. And we were discussing how to get experts and um, facts out and to start looking at some of the most relevant discussions that we could have that we can put into these proposals that will make a difference um, in the long run. We need to think about the proposals that we're putting together not in isolation from the wildlife revision that will happen probably after um, the livestock lists are sorted. We realised one webinar just would not be enough um, to cover everything. So as soon, soon as we started going into that, we realised that we needed a series. So for this week, um, we will have five altogether webinars. Um, the first one today is the commercial use of animals and pandemics. And we will have um, one on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week, and the final one will be on Wednesday the 6th of May. That's to account for a holiday in China on Friday um, and next Monday. So please join, please share the links to the other ones as well. There are, um, tomorrow is very um, important to all of us. It's fur farming and the, the risks um, there. Wednesday is deer, are they wild or domestic? Um, the fourth one is amphibians and reptiles, the overlooked species. And the final one will be looking at farming wildlife to help protect endangered species in the wild. But we'll also have um, a, a segment on legislation and enforcement as well. So I'll hand over to Pei now, who will introduce the speakers uh, and their backgrounds. And also a special thank you to the co-organisers who also saw the vision for a good quality discussion on these topics today. Thanks, Pei. Hi, thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all. Thank you very much. Today, it's a really a very rare opportunity for us to hold the first webinar. We are having a very international webinar. We have panelists and attendees from uh, UK, USA, Australia, North European, etc. We've all joined this webinar together from all around the world. And also we have received the support and we have attendees from the international NGOs and individuals who do care about these topics. Many experts and uh, academicians have uh, joined similar um, seminars and uh, webinars, and it's a really a great honor and a pleasure for us to see you here. I'd like to introduce to you about the purpose of holding such webinars. Well, first of all, I am Su Pei Fin. I am the founder and executive of Act Asia. These five series of webinars are organized by I Care of Act Asia, Act Asia's Institute of Caring for Life, Academic Research and Education, together with One Health, Sun Yat-sen University, the CBC GDF Grain Development Foundation, and the University of Shandong Animal Ethics and Protection Center. Thank you very much for your support for this event. Now, under the uh, pandemics and its spread across the entire globe, our life and the global economy are damaged and influenced. So how do we face a future and prevent another pandemics is the discussion we want to have. And we'd like to thank all of the panelists, uh, including from uh, the experts in the fields of uh, epidemiology and medical science, biology, zoology, education and media coverage and education, etc. Uh, for joining our webinars. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, legislation, culture, education, public health, etc. Well, not today, but throughout the five seminars to 
allow us to hear the insights from the experts in all these fields. We hope that the deep insights and a global perspective could allow all of us to think about the uh, uh, commercial use of animals and preventing the related risks. We hope that these webinars would uh, also be focused on the livestock list, which is currently in the consultation period that will end by the uh, 8th of May, considering whether some of the uh, wild animals are going to be classified as livestock, especially for the fur animals and the deer. Uh, the, uh, the deers, uh, the amphibians and reptiles, etc., we're going to consider such issues from multiple perspectives uh, to uh, achieve better public health, ecological balance in order to prevent COVID-19 and other similar pandemics in the future. So thank you so very much. Before we officially start, before I show a video, I'd like to make sure if everyone is now able to know uh, that on the screen of Zoom, actually you could uh, choose to hear interpretation, simultaneous interpretation. So if you're listening to Chinese, please remember to choose uh, Chinese. And if you listen to English only, please choose English. And if you're bilingual, do nothing so that we could communicate with more ease. Now, I would like to share a video with you. Last week, what a global pandemic uh, organization have uh, published and created this video. COVID-19 has changed our world. The way we live, our economy, our health system, everything. COVID will not be forgotten. To make sure that we never go through this again, we have to understand why it happened. COVID and other zoonotic outbreaks were transmitted to people from animals that were taken from or pushed out of their natural environment. SIV jumped from a primate to a human and then became HIV. SARS jumped from a civet being sold on a menu. Mares from a camel. Bird flu jumped from wild birds. Ebola from bats. There are countless other viruses in nature waiting to be unleashed if we don't change our relationship with nature. Experts agree, rising wildlife trade, industrial farming, and dwindling wildlife habitat have brought people into closer, unnatural contact with animals. Our campaign is taking aim at these root causes of pandemics to prevent them from recurring and harming us again. Working around the world, we are reducing demand for wildlife through consumer education and introducing bans on wildlife trade. Together, we are protecting wildlife populations inside their natural environments. We are stopping wildlife trade by enforcing laws and closing wildlife markets. We are training rangers and helping local communities and poachers transition to sustainable agricultural practices. A new medical cure for COVID-19 will not work against the next virus. Stimulus packages will amount to nothing more than expensive band-aids that need frequent changing if we do not address the root causes. Let's come together and prevent more outbreaks through wildlife and wild habitat protection, as if our lives and economies depend on it.
so, thank you very much for watching this video. By watching this video, we get to know that this pandemic currently is what we are all fighting together throughout the entire world. And it is urgent that we need to review the relation between human beings and the environment. And before we start the official uh, discussion, I'd like to talk about uh, on 24th of February, the Chinese People's Congress have uh, uh, talked about the uh, uh, prohibition about eating wild lives. It's a great decision and it is published. And since then, to now, 15 cities and provinces in China have already passed their local laws and regulations of prohibiting eating uh, wild animals. And many local governments have also together issued, uh, started uh, campaigns, uh, crack down those wildlife uh, cases. And also confiscated many uh, wild animals and related tools, etc. However, what kind of animal can be eaten, what kind of animal should not, is also something we're going to have a deeper discussion through these five webinars. Now I'm handing the microphone back to Dawn. Thank you, Pei. Um, Pei, do you want to introduce Dr. Barbara Mass and Ms. Zhang? She is someone we have uh, specifically invited to today's uh, webinar focusing on animal welfare studies in UK, Cambridge, and she personally had been involved in the uh, wild animal welfare and the wild animal trade researches for 30 to 40 years. Her uh, research on CITES is also very much in depth. And Ms. Zhang Xiaohong is a data analyst. And today, she's going to give us lots of insights to talk about the animal farming, especially intensive farming, and its relationship with uh, people's lives uh, from a data perspective. Lovely, thank you. Um, so we'll move to the panel discussion now where um, I'll ask some questions and, and both speakers will get a chance to, to answer from there. So the first question um, I'll offer to Barbara. Can you explain to us what is the link between exploitation of animals and pandemics, please? Falling at the first okay. hurdle. Hello, no. everybody. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you for listening to us. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, it's an important issue that has reminded us of the fact that we are all connected. Um, more so than maybe we thought and maybe more than we wanted. Um, I would start by saying that the good news, the bad news is that this crisis is of our own making. That is also the good news. Because we have created this, we can undo it and we can change our behavior. And we now know that massive behavioral changes are possible. Um, so I'll get right into it. So the link between, Dawn, to get back to your question, the link between um, pandemics and um, wildlife trade is contact. It's the key issue, contact. Normally wild animals, you know, before there were so many of us, um, they lived away from us mostly or only had limited contact with us. There was a balance of species in a, in a, in a habitat. And when people move in and numbers increase, the first things that go are the big predators. The big predators then mean that other species that reproduce quickly and have a completely different life cycle come up. It also increases contact, so logging, population expansion, road building, all of these things are a contributing factor. Biodiversity buffers us against the influence of pandemics. 
And what happens if, you know, if people start catching animals, either to sell them and to butcher them and to, um, and to eat them, there is contact, contact with animals that would normally, we would normally not have anything to do with. And um, when we put them into farms, particularly, they are, will be very stressed. Uh, stress is not like I'm feeling a bit stressed today because I'm late and I'm stuck in a car. Ja is a traffic jam. Stress is the biological term of stress, which means that our biological function is impaired. And anything can do that, such as, you know, too much light, not enough sleep, bad air, um, cramped conditions, fear, thirst. Um, and you will, in your mind, go through the situations that are associated with wildlife markets and farming, and you will know that all of those are there, all of them. So you have, when animals are stressed, one of the things that goes is their immune function. And we all know this, when we have gone through a stressful period, we sometimes get a cold afterwards. That's because our immune system gets, gets um, depressed. So stressed animals can't fend off diseases as well as healthy animals. And so you have a perfect storm of particularly susceptible animals, um, pathogens, that have the that are multiplying in them more than they would in a healthy animal, and you have contact with human beings, so they the the pathogens in this case the coronaviruses which occur wildly in livestock and in wild animal populations have a chance to adapt. So in farms and on markets there is it's an ideal breeding ground to manufacture pandemic viruses. So that's the link. That's great. That's great. Is there anything to add, Miss Sang or Pei, or shall we move on? We're quite happy. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Um, this one to Miss Sang. Can we farm wild animals intensively and expect them to have good welfare? Well, first of all, we need to make sure that the purpose for these animal farmers the only purpose for them to do it is to go after profits to make money, by which means they have to squeeze down their cost. And intensive farming is exactly designed to lower down the cost. Good welfare farming means higher cost because they need bigger space, bigger room for the animals, higher rent, and we buy materials to accommodate them. All these are additional costs. So, a good welfare and intensive farming are exactly contradictory to each other. Only when, in the following situation, good welfare farming is possible. When people are willing to buy uh, animal products with a higher price because it is raised in a good welfare environment, that's possible. When animals are skinned alive, the fur, uh, are still bought by the consumers. It's definitely not possible for us to raise the good welfare. Only when consumers reject buying such fur products could force the uh, animal farmers to turn towards a higher welfare way and a method of raising and farming animals. So public opinions can help us to change it, but there are several uh, preconditions. The, uh, economy must reach a certain degree so that the public would be able to afford a higher price for better welfare products. And they need to have the awareness to know that animals do have the feeling of pain and fear. They have emotions as well. They do deserve a better life before being slaughtered. And uh, the consumers are willing to pay a higher price for that. And that's going to be a change gradually. That's my point. Thank you. Well, Ms. Zhang, do you want to uh, talk about the intensity about animal farming in several countries? Give us some data. Okay. Well, different uh, countries have very different population and natural resources. Animal husbandry uh, is to meet the demand of uh, human beings. Uh, we use their fur and meat and eggs, etc. Let's take a look in the USA, New Zealand and South Africa. These countries, they have a uh, big land and less population relatively. And they have uh, 
or pressure in providing enough meat and eggs for their own people. And they also export a lot of these animal products and become a pillar of their national economy. But South Africa and then New Zealand, although both these two are husbandry countries, but uh, the number of pigs and the chicken raised in New Zealand and the South Africa are quite low. Like in New Zealand, uh, one year, 1.28 million, South Africa, a few million, but in China, it's actually 420 million pigs every year being uh, uh, produced, I mean, turned into uh, uh, pig products. But for other countries, it's different where people have a, a big population, less natural resources, etc. But let's say India is a very uh, special case because of their religious re reason, many of the Indian people are vegetarians and they have less people to eat pork and beef. So they have less pressure in terms of providing enough meat for the population. Japan have a high density of population but still the overall number of population is still quite low and they have very abundant aquatic resources. And the Japanese people also uh, are accustomed to eat fish rather than uh, other animals. While in China, we have the biggest population in the world and we have uh, a huge pressure in terms of uh, meat supply, we are the only country with uh, more than 100 million pigs. And the uh, number of sheep and goats is also higher than any other country in the world per capita, by which uh, it's a fact that we cannot rely on the animals we raise by ourselves. In many cases, China needs to import from other countries. And now let's compare uh, the pandemics, the epidemic situation between these nations. Well, we found that the epidemic situation is closely related to the public health degree, their number of animals being raised and the need for meat, etc. Like in the USA and China, both have uh, a large number of animals being bred and farmed. So uh, also, these two countries have relatively higher ability to test and treat the viruses, yet still we have uh, the epidemics. For example, the mad cow disease, which happened in 2003, caused billions of US dollars of loss. And in 2009, the swine flu, afterwards bird flu, etc., a big trouble for their own nation as well as many other nations in the world. In China, as we know that SARS uh, caused a huge, huge, huge loss. And every year there are bird flu cases. In 2008 and 2009, there had been the, uh, uh, the African swine fever, ASF, which caused a 40% cut in the number of pigs and caused the, the uh, pork price to go up, which still haven't gone down right now. And now COVID-19, as we all know, if we take a look at the New Zealand, although it is a husbandry country, but the absolute, the total number of uh, animals is still quite small when compared to other nations. The number of sheep they have is only a tenth of uh, when compared to China. And also the per capita or per family, uh, poor, uh, per, per capita pig and cow also low and they, has, they have a quite high uh, ability to maintain their public health system. So they are not doing, uh, they're doing pretty well right now in terms of epidemic situation. And once the uh, public uh, disease event comes up in India, there are a higher number of fatality in India. So that's my introduction. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sag. That's um, a, a good full answer there. Um, and really important to say that, yeah, quite often the farmers that are um, running these farms are doing it for profit reasons and usually incentivized um, by subsidies as well to do so. Um, whether or not it gets a better profit or not 
at this moment, I think we can say that the pandemic is probably going to outweigh, um, you know, the, the causes to the economic situation after the pandemic will outweigh any benefits that we've made in profiting from um, our use of animals. But it's definitely um, a good place to start. Yeah. We are running over time a little well, bit. Could already. I just add? Yes, uh, would you know that, that, you know, there are please. roughly 1.4 million uh, billion, billion people in China now. And the meat consumption, as my colleague has already said, has gone up dramatically mm. since the 1990s. So the average person, every person now eats on average two and a half times more meat than they did in the early 1990s. And the problem with that, that exacerbates the pandemic and animal welfare issue that we've talked about so far, is exacerbated by the fact that there is, you know, that welfare legislation uh, in New Zealand is amongst the strongest in the world. Mm. It goes down to crustaceans, you know, the life yeah. boiling of crustaceans is prohibited. So there are very stringent um, animal welfare standards for farming, um, which sadly um, we are waiting for from China after, you know, and that would be a, a fantastic step forward. Mm. Yeah, and I think with New Zealand legislation, they also have sentience, um, so that's how progressive they are. I don't think the UK has that um, as of yet. Oh, the EU has. The EU has. Yeah. So. Well, before, while we are speaking about economic uh, issues, mm -hmm. commercial use of animals have its relation with the pandemics, and there is a statistics saying that the loss from this COVID-19 have already surpassed uh, 2.7 trillion US dollars, mm. which is 2 billion RMB in China. The economic loss is huge, both for the uh, whole world and for each nation and locally. Barbara, do you want to jump in quickly? No, I just no. answered. I'm ready for the just, next question. Okay. Thank you. I was just, you know, I'm like, these oh. are sums of money. You know? That are huge. That, yeah, yeah, that are yeah. huge. And this is going to cast yeah. a long shadow for many years over all of our lives. Sure, sure. Um, so the next question is um, for Barbara, really. Um, there's some misconceptions about if, if animals, even if they're wild, if animals are breeding in captivity, then they must have good welfare. Could you just give us um, a, a couple of minutes on, on if that's true or if it's not true? Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I mean, it, intuitively it makes sense, but unfortunately it's not true. <laughs> and here's why. Um, breeding and reproduction is one of our, um, uh, one of the main driving forces for, in biology for an animal you know, like survival. We want to survive and most animals want to breed. That's why most animals live, those two things. And while they're living, they interact with environmental stimuli all the time. I've touched on that already earlier. You know, it's either a bit too hot or a bit too cold. We, it's too hot, we walk in the shade, it's too cold. The lion walks into the sun. So we try to adapt to, you know, to environmental change as much as we can. And then we hit a level where we cannot adapt. That could be either, you know, in, in captivity, where control over most issues, or most aspects of our lives, um, whether we are human in prison or whether we are an animal in a cage, has been taken from us. So you no longer have control over when you eat, where you eat, what you eat, um, whether you mate, when you sleep, there may be noise, there may be light, there may be all of these things which affect your internal physiology. It affects your behavior and it affects certain life, um, life cycle parameters such as longevity, breeding, which is hormonal. So if your breeding goes, things are very bad indeed. Yeah. So animals, some animals are more, react more with not breeding anymore pandas the great chinese panda you know so how much money is lavished on it in guangdong and they don't breed readily because they are not entirely happy where they are they are not under natural conditions so this animal that is cherished by your nation by the chinese nation and has lots of international support and so 
is not wanting to breed naturally. So some other animals breed, particularly if they've been far farm animals breed, but they live shorter periods of time. So there's a trade-off. And we say in order to establish whether an animal's welfare is good or bad, we need to look at a whole range of physiological, behavioral, and um, life cycle um, indicators, such as breeding, longevity, temperature, heavy breathing, cortisol hormone levels that indicate stress, reproductive hormone levels. And if only one of those is out of whack, we can say that the animal's welfare is poor. So sadly to say, you know, the animal is breeding. Um, there's a wonderful example from a massive dairy cow farm in China that has 30,000 cows, I dread to think. And the cows last for about two to three seasons, lactation seasons, while on a smaller farm, they may la last for a decade or more. So this is one of those indicators where you say, well, they're breeding, yeah, but they're dying quickly because they're pushed to the limit and they cannot cope with their environment. Mm. Lovely, that's very good. One of the um, reasons for putting animals on the livestock list is if they breed well in captivity. So it's, um, it's good to, to clarify that one. What a good idea. <laughs> so the next, um, next question is to Miss Zhang. Um, in China legislation, how are animals categorized? Is it by taxonomic group or is it by usage? Um, are wild animals on domestic animals or species separated? Well, in China, we have the wild animal protection law, but also the uh, livestock list you mentioned. Well, the breeding and farming of wild animals, now we have five uses, uh, commercial use, food, clothing, TCM, viewing, and experiments. Well, after the prohibition of eating wildlife animal order was published by the People's Congress, earlier this year, both the law and the list would have to be updated in the new consultation draft of the list. One thing which is of our concern, the criteria for livestock have changed greatly. Previously, or well, originally, the original version, there are two articles. Uh, only when that animal, its phenotype has undergone a fundamental change when compared with the original wild animal, and it must be widely used in production. Can it be regarded as a livestock? But now in the con opinion consultation draft, these two criteria are cancelled, which means as long as there are quarantine procedures fitting uh, any uh, farm, the wild animals would be classified as livestock. If according to this standard, lots of wild animals could be classified as livestock, including the canines and cat uh, series, cat uh, class of uh, animals. We do have certain quarantine procedures that they could follow, by which mean, uh, if according to that standard, this is a bad use. They could be classified as livestock, and uh, there are huge dangers to that if this yeah. version passes. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting. It's something that we didn't consider when we got the ban on the 24th of February. I think we were all ready to celebrate that that was it. That was the, the usage stopped. But now we realize there's five different commercial uses, um, and the other four are continuing. So really interesting. Um, well, just now the five uh, uses in the uh, livestock list, the standards and criteria is really uh, requires much reviewing. Yeah. Oh, mute. Yes, I would like to add to that that um, for a pandemic virus to form and to spill over it doesn't the virus doesn't care whether the animal is considered livestock 
or whether it's farmed or wild or butchered uh, in, in a market or in a slaughterhouse, or all it wants is contact. So reclassifying this is kind of a bit moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, so we are not getting away from the problem by, by reclassifying some clearly wild animals as, as livestock. And bear in mind, the risk is there with livestock too. We had bird flu, swine flu, you know, I just have to just quickly look at my notes so I don't tell you any nonsense, but it's important, this one. For example, the, um, the swine flu pandemic in the late, in the 2000, the late 2000s, um, are believed to have their origin in Mexico on pig farms. And this is a perfect example of how viruses jump and recombine in intensive conditions. It, this virus, it is called um, H1N1, um, contained elements, genetic elements of three pig influenza viruses, one poultry influenza virus, and one human influenza virus. So you can see it's that mishmash when you have animals and people together, it's uh, the perfect cauldron to generate such things and reclassifying animals will not help either the Chinese people, um, nor the animals, nor the wider global community forward. So as you say, it needs to be revised. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We've got problems, whether it's a, a domestic animal or an animal or a wild animal. So Miss Sang, for the next question, can you tell us what is the current situation? How are the laws being updated? What's the process that's going to happen next? Now, the non-eating wildlife breeding and farming is still legal in China. So we do not know that after uh, these uh, prohibition of eating orders are released, how much of those farming and breeding could be reduced because the virus spread largely in those areas, in the farms. So whether the uh, danger for the pandemics could be further reduced, it depends on after we have the revision of the uh, wild animal protection law and the livestock list. After they're updated, how much it will make the change and how much it would influence the reality to see if it still encourages or inhibits farming and we still have to wait to see. Only when we can find a policy uh, inhibiting the number of wild animals being bred and farmed, we can lower down the danger of further pandemics. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to add before I move on? Okay, no. So the next two questions I'm kind of going to put together because we're short on time, but also we've, we've talked about one already. So um, the first one is what do you want to change on the livestock lists? And I think we've talked about that in terms of really, we're just moving the problem. We have a problem with intensive farming and the commercial use. Uh, but then on to what are the changes that we require to prevent future pandemics? Um, what can we do? COVID is enough for us all to say, hang on, we need to reevaluate what we're doing with our animals. What do we need to, so. So first of all. So first what, of all, the, yeah. Would you change? The wild animals for sure need yeah. to come off the list. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, there are wild animals. Yeah. And I guess for administrative purposes, I guess maybe the Chinese government wants to put them into this category. But the reality is that they are wild animals. They have not been domesticated over hundreds and possibly thousands of years. Um, and still, if they, even if they were, they would still be susceptible as, you know, we have a lot of problems with pig viruses, poultry viruses, and so on. Um, the pig and the human immune system is very similar. Don't take that as an offense, it's a fact. Uh, so, oink. Um, so I would like to say that, and so it's important that wild animals are treated as wild animals. They need to come off the list. They need not be farmed um, because this is a ticking time bomb. 
we are, you know, China is also not only a great consumer of wildlife from within, but also a lot of wild animals come in from elsewhere in the world. And conversely, a lot of reptiles and other animals come from China to the EU and to the States and so on. So we're giving these animals a first, these viruses, a first class ticket around the world by engaging in wildlife trade, for, be it for pets, for food, for, for fur, for ornaments, for exotic pets. Mm. Yeah, so we need, to, we need to seriously change how we interact if we're serious about, about changing this. And um, I would like to say that, um, I guess we haven't got time to go into the biodiversity thing now, but the vast majority, so three out of four, new infections, infectious diseases in people now come from wild animals or livestock. So this is a real, real danger. The disease, the number of disease outbreaks has also been increasing steadily over the last few years. So between, and hold on to your seats, between 1980 and 2013, there were 12,012 outbreaks compromising uh, comprising 44 million individual cases and affecting every country in the world we need to put the lid on it now what um and what does keep it meaning what does that mean though um we just go um what does it mean it means that we have a fantastic opportunity here mm. china has taken a tremendous step that we would have said we can only dream of you know, even a few months ago, by banning eat the consumption for food, but the other uses need to be included. Mm. As I said, a virus doesn't care if you're farmed for medicine or for food. It doesn't care whether you're bred for or, or captured for the pet trade. It doesn't care whether you are capped or bred, bred or slaughtered for, for any other, for display purposes. It doesn't care. So if we want to keep people safe, and if you want to keep yourself safe, get rid of the contact, eliminate the contact, and that means saying no to wildlife trade and consumption of any kind. Um, we ha will we learn or will we go back to business as usual after this? You know, after the Tsarist epidemic, things chilled out quite quickly again, but this is much bigger. Mm. This is big. And who is to say that the next one won't be even bigger? If you think about measles, it's very infectious virus. Um, and um, the Ebola virus, which came from wildlife in Africa, um, kills 90% of the people it infects. Now imagine a combination between a virus that is as infectious as measles and as deadly as Ebola, we will not be having another um, webinar. Mm. So almost half of the new diseases that germ from, from animals to humans after 1940 can be traced to changes in land use also, agriculture, wildlife hunting. Um, and there are currently about 10,000 mammalian viruses around that could be dangerous to people. So what I suggest is, as I said, social distancing from wild animals. <laughs> social distancing from wild animals. Leave them alone. Leave them be in the wild. It will be better for them and for us. It will keep us healthier, happier, and them happier and safer. Um, and we need to go beyond sticking plasters on something like, you know, tinkering a bit here and adjusting a bit there because the next virus could be even worse. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Barbara. That's really good. And Miss Sang? Well, I want to say wildlife and the livestock lists, how they are uh, updated. It's going to be a game of uh, fight between several uh, sectors, although the central government have uh, considered public health as the first priority, yet uh, people do hold their own benefits. So we all need to work together to force them to uh, update the list and the uh, 
wild animal protection law towards a direction that is better. And also we need to know what they are thinking of. Uh, what's behind changing the law and updating the list? Is it to uh, uh, meet the demand of importing more wild animals from uh, other countries or what? We need to know the purpose. And my hope is that uh, we could preserve the boundary between wild animals and livestock and preserve the traditional livestock to meet human need and leave uh, biodiversity to the wild animals still as it is, as it was. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Sang. So that um, sort of comes to the end of our questions and we do have 10 minutes left. So I'm just looking down at the questions here. So the South African government, oh, yeah, currently has draft legislation proposing the reclassifica reclassification of certain wild animals to livestock, such as lions and rhino, etc. We are furiously trying to fight this, but I'm personally suspect, and this is just my opinion, that it is also to supply the Chinese or Asian market. What are the most important points we can raise to prevent the legislation from being passed? Um, I think that's where we're up to. Okay. Um, yes, I'm Nikki. I'm aware of the um, sorry state um, of, uh, of this situation in South Africa. Um, and I feel your pain. Um, it is uh, to, again, it is the people who, have, who are breeding lions and who are breeding rhinos in South Africa have for decades tried to open international trade in rhino horn. Uh, for example, let's stay with the rhinos, the high value commodity. Rhino horn is worth a lot of money. And there are some people who are breeding hundreds and some over a thousand rhinos in South Africa who have tried every trick in the book to try and open the international trade in rhinos. They've threatened to leave CITES. They said it is to, to save communities. They're saying they're saving rhinos. Those are rhinos that are fed, watered. They live in unnatural conditions. They are not wild, yet they are. Um, and but they are a wild animal. They have not undergone a long process of domestication for which there are clear definitions. And I think it is just a tactic to try and get around the CITES ban, um, which prohibits the trade in, in, um, in rhino horn. Um, and I think it is their latest, it's the latest installment from South Africa trying to get around uh, the international trade ban on, on rhino horn. I think we need to all get together to fight this. Rhino horn consumption is illegal in, in China. It is illegal in Vietnam, the two biggest markets. Um, um, at the last CITES meeting, there was a lot of um, negotiation, and a lot of contacts between Vietnami Vietnamese and South African delegates and the Vietnamese said quite clearly to the South Africans, we don't want your rhino horn, we have enough problems. But it is a commercially motivated move. Um, there is, they also are saying that um, they, you know, they, they, they can uh, flood the market with captive bred rhino horn, this argument that breeding animals in captivity takes pressure away from wild animals. That has not been proven at all that's been tried in bears, it's been tried in vicuña, it's been tried in, uh, in a host of other species and it's backfired badly and it's backfired because of lookalike problems, enforcement problems, confusion amongst um, consumers and because Asian consumers get a mixed message and have a preference for wild caught product. Um, so, the person who has started to advocate trade in Vicuña to get poaching away has completely done a 360 or what, a turn around and said, now this was a big mistake. I regret ever starting this. Tra farming wild animals will not take pressure away from endangered species. Thank you. And that actually is um, going to be brought up in webinar five this week. So if you're interested in, in more of that, please listen to webinar five. Um, the next question um, I'm just skipping ahead to 
Um, is the risk of disease spillover from animals to humans decreased when coming into contact with dead animal products, meat, etc., more than live animals? I think it is. Um, it, it depends partially on the pathogen and it depends partially on the duration you know how long has the item been left you know we all have had lists on our whatsapp and emails that the coronavirus can survive on cardboard for this long and plastic for this long and you know um and so it depends on this people who are handling for example skins in fur farms would still be at risk mm. people who are handling live animals will be at risk it depends, it's entirely specific to, to the virus. And there have been more and more outbreaks uh, over the, the, you know, since the 1940s, the pace of pandem zoonotic pandemics has increased. Um, and I personally don't want um, to be around for the next one. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, <laughs> and how wonderful is it? Look what we've changed. Look what we've yep. changed. We don't fly much anymore. You know, things that we would have thought impossible. You know, climate change is killing people um, and nobody, you know, people just yeah, they can't be bothered. Virus, bang, we're not going out anymore. <laughs> the question here is, some countries like Australia, which also uses wildlife for commercial purposes, why don't they have zoonotic disease outbreak? No, no, no. I don't think, you know, this should be a China only target it should affect every country in the world where this goes on every continent africa um austral asia europe you know we get europeans get uh, reptiles from china and from other parts of asia and from africa and they're sold in reptile fairs uh, hugely dangerous so are you saying australia may not have the outbreak now but this might happen in future yeah. yes i mean they have they have a disease outbreak um they have they have corona they have covid-19 um but um you know australia is also very thinly populated you know this is the other issue china is very very densely populated so in a way you china takes a lot of boxes for the perfect storm for pandemic creation with the hard, the deeply entrenched consumption of wild animals the government encouraging wildlife farming uh, dense human populations and wildlife markets. So, but this is by no means, and uh, you know, uh, 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 this um, is a universally apl applicable. We have issue. another question. I want to ask uh, two Chinese questions. Okay. Now we have two questions from uh, Chinese audience. Uh, why do we identify uh, wild animals as the source of viruses? Because people used to be one kind of wild animal as well. Barbara, this question is for you. We still are. <laughs> We're primates. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. I mean, you know, there's animal there's disease transmission between animals, like for example, in the SARS example, where it went from bats to civet cats to, to humans. Um, so there is trans disease transmission every which way. Humans are not the, you know, the only host viruses jumps to, but because we are the dominant species and on the planet, and we are making use of all the other species. If you look at, for example, a lion, a lion will eat whatever is living where it lives. You know, it will eat birds, it will eat antelope, it will, you know, eat takazeba or something. It will not eat a Chinese freshwater turtle or an African, or it will not eat a polar bear, will not start fighting with a polar bear or a seal. Um, so the movement that we have created um, by commercially exploiting and um, wild animals is, I, has, I think, upped the risk for us tremendously. Um, and we haven't done that just within national boundaries, but we have, you know, we have given it air tickets to fly around the world and, and travel, you know, and 
for viruses to travel from one continent to another. And um, that is unfortunate. And as I said, what, what we're for waiting for a measles-like virus with an Ebola um, fatality rate, we are done for. Yangyang's question. Now we have uh, learned from this epidemic that the way we treat wild animals, the way we exploit the species of the wild animals, has accelerated how the viruses can be uh, transmitted into uh, human beings. The, the next question. What do we think of the ban of the, the wildlife consumption and to livestock at least? Or uh, is it going to be, you know, for example, the big cats like um, tiger and, you know, um, the Leopards. pangolins, would that be listed under livestock? What would happen about that? Um, uh, let me answer this question. So I think there's a critical thing here that we do not know whether the list is going to be longer or shorter. We still don't know what's behind their uh, intention. We hope it to be shortened, of course. And of course, this is what we need to work for before May the 5th, May the 8th. And also, uh, if we're going to have a revision of the wild animal protection law this year uh, for the uh, use usage of the wild animals is also something we want to change, as Barbara has mentioned. Although now uh, eating is prohibited, but still other four uses are allowed, are legal, and the viruses doesn't care about that. Uh, and we have to face all these challenges. As long as we are still exploiting such wild animals, uh, the danger is still there and we need to work towards prohibiting or inhibiting that. I think we'd like to say a big thank you to Miss Sang. Thank you for being here with us today and joining us. And to Dr. Barbara Mass, you've been wonderful. Um, and I think we've got a lot out of the topics. I think that if we could keep the webinar onwards, it would still be going in another six hours. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us today. And we have other four webinars going after today. Today we have talked about the exploitation of wild animals, the commercial use and its relations, but also we're going to further talk about fur farming, uh, deer, the list, etc. And also we need to understand that the pandemic is not a local problem. It's something we need to unite all together. And it's also one of the main purposes that we hold this event together. Thank you so much, Barbara Maas, Ms. Zhang Xiaohong, and all of our other staff behind the screen. Let's uh, meet again tomorrow at this time. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for having us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.